So I'm going to talk about uh, our, our work in, in COVID and, and vaccines in general. Um, and I kind of just wanted to start with the fact that we have a new phrase in our household and throughout our company uh, that's kind of made it into our daily lexicon. And it's called COVID time. You know, things that uh, normally should take years or compressed to a quarter, uh, things that otherwise you do in a long-term project, it's done over a weekend. Um, you know, basically, the idea is why, you know, wait to do something when you can just do it now, because who knows when the next pandemic is going to hit. And for the world, it's kind of been a COVID time for the development of the vaccine, because a vaccine, you know, that traditionally has taken multiple years has really shortened to a year, and it's it's incredible. So, you know, momentum fueled by adrenaline, fueled by momentum, it creates this ridiculous environment of chaos and insane productivity, and with it, all the compression of craziness, endless nights, and stress points as well. Uh, but when you bring your head up and you take a moment to reflect, you realize that you're light years ahead of uh, where you have been and are really grateful for that COVID time. Um, needless to say, uh, I and my family, um, probably lots of people here, but our company has been swept up in COVID time and the sheer speed at which things have moved has been incredible. And so what I plan to share with you today is kind of just a, a snippet of that perspective um, of how things have been shaking out and just uh, our insider you know, perspective as a small biotech company on what the concrete and more abstract side effects that we've seen um, and should be aware of. So just by a quick way of introduction, I'm the CEO, uh, as mentioned, of COVAX, but also a company called Vaccinity, which is the result of uh, two vaccine companies. So we're developing the first peptide-based uh, multi-tope COVID vaccine that's currently in phase two, uh, entering phase three next quarter, and we anticipate our first emergency use authorization uh, second half of this year. So our focus is a bit different um, because we're targeting distribution specifically in the developing world. You know, even before COVID, um, we had this clear mission to democratize health, where we believe that all human lives matter and deserve access to life-changing medicines. Even though um, health rhymes with wealth, uh, you know, we would hope that the two aren't synonymous. Um, so one of the things that, just personal background, uh, I am a recovering lawyer. I'm an ex-management consultant. Uh, I'm a one-time auditor of a summer immunology course, and that's basically the extent of my um, advanced knowledge in, in the sciences. Uh, I'm also the proud mother of two young children whose latest thing has been basically conducting science experiments in our kitchen. Um, you know, thankfully, I'm not responsible for the science at either our company or our kitchen. Um, but we, we do have things that uh, drive the, the, the larger mission of what we do. So, um, you know, our company and our technology and, and anything that you see, you know, all these new technologies like mRNA coming out and really they're overnight successes that have taken decades and decades of work. Um, so our underlying technology actually came from my mother. Uh, she was a remarkable pioneer. She was the first Asian at Rockefeller and the youngest lab had a Memorial Sloan Kettering. Um, and together she with my father started our parent company, United by Medical, uh, that developed the first ever peptide-based blood diagnostic tests in the world. Uh, so why is that special? I mean, uh, basically it showed that you could develop synthetically with a peptide, something with equal performance as something viral lysate based. And so for the first time when it was created, developing countries uh, could afford to screen their blood supply of bloodborne infections like HIV and HCV. So um, supported by a number of NIH grants later, uh, the technology matured and actually got its first commercial operation, ironically, in another pandemic situation, uh, this time for animals. So for those of you in the UK, um, you may remember, but there's a disease called foot and mouth disease for you know, livestock. And it was a huge problem uh, for nations and actually became a global problem. Uh, and so very similarly to today, uh, governments were clamoring for vaccines and um, Taiwan actually asked us to design a vaccine for it. And we did, and it happened to work. Um, after the pandemic settled, you know, we were thrilled because we had the first ever uh, fully synthetic peptide vaccine. And we wanted to, to basically uh, enter the market. But very similarly to this, um, there were already players in the field. So there were five players. It was, you know, two of the major conglomerates and everyone was saying you can't compete on price. Um, but we said, well, we have something safe and maybe we're a bit stubborn uh, because it was our first vaccine and we wanted to bring it to market. So 
um, you know, uh, people were saying, uh, you know, people don't really care about safety. They don't care if their, their livestock is get sick or not. Uh, you'll probably get about 2% of the market share. Um, so, you know, we were stubborn and we decided to launch anyway. And sure enough, the first year it was 2%. Uh, but what happened was interesting because people started talking. And by year three, we actually had 50% of the market share. Uh, because it turns out people do care if their, you know, livestock gets sick. Just like we, you know, if we get sick after a vaccine, we're kind of down for uh, a few hours, a day or two. Um, it matters for, for animals because if they're down, they don't eat food, which converts to, to weight, uh, which converts directly to the pocketbook. So at that point, it was actually a total gift that we could scale manufacturing uh, based on our synthetic peptide technology because we ended up producing hundreds of millions of doses for the market. And today our sister company um, produces about half a billion doses a year. So this is um, just a long way of showing that there, there's always a history to the technology and it's very interesting to, to recognize, especially as we uh, begin leveraging them in these situations just like COVID. Um, fast forward and we've brought our technology forward uh, to today or last year when we decided that we want to get into the COVID race as well and, and really help serve the country or the, the world. So what we've learned in this past year has really been extraordinary. Um, the first is just the speed. And of course, you know, at our company, it's, it's extraordinary, but really I have to commend everyone else uh, in the ecosystem for, um, you know, really making a vaccine happen within a year and seeing deployment. It's, it's incredible. Um, and one of the things that we, we realize and something that we hope will stay is this unprecedented collaboration uh, between multiple stakeholders to make it happen. Um, you know, traditionally in our industry, uh, there's a lot of proprietary information and that often creates kind of silos of information. But really what we saw in COVID was, you know, one of our first collaborators was actually one of our competitors. Uh, we were talking with CSOs at major companies and sharing, um, you know, insights about what we were each seeing about, about the virus uh, very early on. Um, you know, they're informal groups and formal groups getting together um, and sharing at unprecedented levels. So it's something that uh, that is, you know, again, unprecedented, but one that I, I hope will uh, continue and set a new cadence of drug development. Um, also surprisingly, and I don't know how often this gets talked about, but uh, this virus seems to actually be quite straightforward to neutralize. Um, I think efficacy is pleasantly surprising. Um, and so, you know, seeing the efficacy rates that we're seeing today um, is really wonderful, uh, despite the variants, but it's something that tells a lot, a lot about, uh, that we're learning about the virus itself. Um, and then another reflection, mostly from the, you know, from, from what we're seeing, and is manufacturing and logistics still matter a lot. Uh, it's always a huge issue. Um, but if you notice, you know, there's all sorts of risks in drug development and the clinical trials have actually gone very well, better than expected, faster and more efficacious. Uh, but it's, it's often the part that is behind the scenes um, that's not as sexy, that, that's uh, also very challenging, but yet critical as well to the effective deployment. So, you know, thankfully for us, we, we actually know how to scale, but for other of these new technologies, it's... Um, it's more difficult and they're growing pains with the scale up process. Uh, you know, for supply chain, you know, we had a supplier tell us that the stoppers we had uh, ordered were delayed because, you know, they had to give them to someone else. Um, you know, for logistics, we've heard stories of vaccines going bad at the airport because they didn't know what to do with them after they landed. Um, these are things that are trial and tribulations of, of doing such things at COVID time pace, um, but they're, they're there, they're definitely real. And also on quality. You know, all this time, uh, you can't sacrifice on quality. So certain delays are really associated with ensuring that the proper systems are validated and approved. Um, you know, every vaccine has dozens of tests, um, but how do you know about the shelf life of a vaccine if you haven't even had that amount of time? Uh, so these are things that um, are ongoing growing pains, but still quite interesting to, to reflect on. Um, and the overall result, frankly, has been incredible. Um, I was just hearing the, the speaker before and just to, to think about the way that the U.S. itself has come, for instance, um, you know, 
in just a year, basically 30% of Americans have been vaccinated. Uh, and there are three commercially available vaccines. Um, you know, if you had asked me that last, last year, I, I would uh, be hard pressed to say that. Um, and so it's, again, an extraordinary feat. Um, but on a global scale, it's also important that it's very different. So this is not representative, but you know, um, some of the, the greatest nations, UK, Switzerland, Iceland, Singapore, Italy, Germany, they're, they're only 5% fully vaccinated. Um, you know, Canada, Brazil, Finland, Argentina, th these are uh, very developed economies and yes, less than 2% fully vaccinated. Um, some of these others are less than 1%. And so what you think of is what does this mean for the rest of the developing world? And when you look at it, you realize that there are over 50 countries that have yet to administer a single dose of vaccine. Now, does this matter? Absolutely, right? If you just look at some of the countries on every continent, some of them are really having their, basically the greatest surge in COVID cases to date. Now, you know, we in the US uh, where I am today, um, you know, we're doing fantastically on our vaccination campaign and, and curbing COVID, but uh, we have to realize that sometimes, you know, we're in our own little bubble and the rest of the world is still out there and people are struggling. So there's still this significant unmet need. Um, I mean, if you just see on this case, like Brazil is surging, uh, places in Europe are surging, um, you know, Middle East, Asia, these are uh, countries that have yet to get vaccinated or are still uh, getting drips and drops in, um, but the, it's still serious on a global basis. And as a result, there's still significant unmet need. I won't, I'll go through this slide very quickly, but really uh, the top three are very important, particularly for developing world. Um, you know, one is just accessibility. Can you deliver the vaccine? Can you make enough for the vaccine? And can you make it at an affordable enough price? Right. Most of these uh, companies have been subsidized tremendously by governments um, and without which we wouldn't be you know, at the speed we're operating. But um, you know, this is something that at least we at Vaccinity try to address, but uh, we actually look to others as well in our industry to, to make sure that we don't forget about the developing world. Um, the need is there and it's real. And not to mention, it is a trend that is beyond COVID, right? You look at any of the, the major ailments that are still out there, the major medical unmet needs, Alzheimer's, you know, high cholesterol. In, in the US, in the developed world, you have a, a big population. But what you don't realize is that you know, diseases don't discriminate. So on the world basis, it's even more massive. Um, you know, US and developed worlds are really just a fraction of them, um, just like Alzheimer's or hypercholesterolemia. And so the question is really, what should we do? Um, at first, it's our mission to serve everyone. Uh, you know, we're destined to save and serve the underserved. You target the developing world. Um, but what I'd like to say is it also makes good business sense, right? There's a classic framework that of the, this uh, from Blue Ocean Strategy Book um, of the Red Ocean and Blue Ocean. And basically red oceans are is that are existence today, um, that it's highly competitive, um, you know, it's bloody competition, right? Hence the term red oceans. Whereas blue oceans are ones that, that really aren't in existence today. They're unknown markets, they're untainted by competition. Um, the rules of the game are still waiting to be set. And in some ways, um, I would posit that vaccines have been the blue ocean of biotech and drug development for a long time um, prior to COVID. You know, it was something where there aren't that many players and uh, it was, you know, really a, a blue ocean of, of um, uh, innovation, which is someplace where we've been playing for many years. And I would also posit that developing world uh, is a blue ocean, a place where innovation traditionally bleeds over um, and is really kind of taken from the red ocean over. But why not begin innovating and being able to develop? It's not just a price war, but it's also a place where your technology uh, can innovate. So it would be great if we could figure out how to bring the best drugs to this untapped market. So I just end here by saying, you know, um, I would hope that we find those blue oceans that, and show that those are not only the smart thing to do for businesses, uh, but also the right thing to do for impact on humanity.